think we can go ahead and introduce Lilia. Um, so happy to see a lot of familiar names and faces on today. Um, and just as happy to introduce you to Lilia Perez. Uh, Lilia is the Grants and Programs Manager at Arts Mid-Hudson, as well as a working artist. She oversees the administering of over 220,000 annually in public and private funding, including the creation of applications and guidelines for grants. As part of her role, she also presents information such as, excuse me, sessions such as today, uh, today's workshop, and provides professional development workshops and facilitates grant submission review panels. Uh, on top of that, among other things, Lilia also manages Arts Mid Hudson's gallery. Um, also, just as a side note, we're very proud at SUNY New Paltz to say that Lilia is an alum. She received a BFA in photography here in 2015. Um, that's all for my introduction. I'm Zach here at the Dorsky. I'm again very happy um, to have you here and happy that we're able to provide some resources for working artists in the Hudson Valley and hopefully beyond. Um, welcome, Lilia, and welcome, everybody. Thank you, Zach. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for your interest and for joining us today. Just want to thank, of course, the Dorsky Museum and SUNY New Paltz for having me and Zach for uh, setting all of this up and coordinating with me and Anna Conlin, of course, the curator at the Dorsky for having the initial conversation about this way back when, when you were planning the, when she was planning the new folk exhibit. So um, I'm, you know, this is going to be a casual uh, workshop where I'm going to run through a PDF that I've put together uh, with some information about grant writing, letting you know about some local grant opportunities, and just giving you my perspective as a grants manager in terms of what we're looking for on the other side. Uh, and so this PDF you'll see in this information, there's a lot of text here. It's for that reason uh, that uh, I've asked Zach if he can email it out to everybody after, so you'll have a guide, uh, you know, to look at after. So if you see a lot of text, don't worry, you don't have to read all of it right now. Try to listen to what I'm talking about, um, and then uh, you can always look at the materials later. Please, uh, if everyone knows how to use the chat feature, uh, just click on the bottom bar, there's the chat button. If you have a question or a clarification or need me to define a term I'm using, just type it in the chat, I'll keep an eye on that throughout. If it's a longer question, um, please save it until the end. Uh, and you know something that you'll want to get on and just speak and ask the question. Uh, and if uh, you want to speak to me one on one about something having to do with Arts Mid Hudson's programs, I'll tell you how to do that later on. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. Okay. Of course the. Okay. Zach, can you see it? I can't hear you, but can you give me a thumbs up if you can see it? Yes, great. Okay, awesome. All right, everyone. Let me just adjust my window because when we go full screen, of course, it hides. Zach, I might need you to um, tell me about the chat because it's not really letting me see it with everything else. So I actually got it, but let me, uh, I might call on you a couple of times just if questions come up. Sure thing. Thank you. Okay. So again, we're going to be talking about grant writing, but it's, it's from a grant manager's perspective. I'm really going to focus today on the other side of things and what we might be looking for when you're submitting a proposal. And so my name is Lilia Perez, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Grants and Programs Manager for Arts Mid Hudson. Uh, that's my email address for Arts Mid Hudson, and that's my personal email address as well. Um, and if anyone would like to write in the chat, you know, who you are, if you're an artist, where you're located, if you represent an organization, it's always nice to drop that kind of thing in and then other people who are here can see that you're here and meet you. So feel free to introduce yourself in the chat uh, if you feel like you would like to. So we're going to talk uh, briefly, I'm going to tell you about some Arts Mid Hudson programs because we actually have a deadline coming up. I'm going to talk about how you get started in the grant writing process, understanding what a funding program is looking for, provide some general tips, and I'll also talk briefly about work samples at the end. 
So Art Smith Hudson, I hope that um, if, you're, if you haven't heard of us already, I hope that you'll take a look. Uh, we are the local arts service organization and we serve Duchess Orange and Ulster counties and we serve as the arts council for Duchess and Ulster counties. Uh, and we administer funding on behalf of those two counties as well. We have three major annual grants and funding programs. Um, we have a gallery and related partnership gallery programs. We do workshops and professional development. We have arts awards for Ulster and Dutchess counties. Um, we market local programs through our newsletters and email blasts and our community calendar. Uh, we also have artist opportunities listings there. So if you're looking for a job in the arts or call for artists, check out our website. We update that almost daily. Um, we have a folk arts program and an arts education program. And of course, I'll, when I send you out the PDF, I'll drop in the link to our website. It is just uh, www.artsmidhudson.org. I'm actually just gonna type it in the chat right now so that you can get there. And so right now, uh, uh, Arts Mid Hudson is a uh, re-grant organization. So we don't have our own funding or endowments. We administer public funding. And so um, one of the major programs that we administer is called the Decentralization Grant Program. And we administer this on behalf of the New York State Council on the Arts. The deadline for this program is coming up in a month. It's October 28th. If you're an individual artist and you were planning to make new work in 2021, I strongly recommend taking a look at this grant program. Uh, for students listening, this isn't available uh, for full-time students. Full-time students are not eligible, but keep an eye on this program and keep it in mind for the future when you graduate. There is, uh, this is a program of the New York State Council on the Arts, and there is an a organization like Arts Mid Hudson, which serves every county in New York State. So if you live in New York State, you have access to this funding, even if you're not applying to us for it. And we have two categories of this funding currently open, uh, our community arts grant, which is for public arts programming, and our individual artist commission, which is for individual artists to create new work in 2021. Uh, and you can find a lot of information. There's so much information about this program. I'm doing a bi-weekly a Zoom Q&A sessions. There are five YouTube videos I created going over the program, uh, in-depth guidelines and application and other resources. Go to artsmidhudson.org and you can check out all of that information. We also administer, as I noted before, Ulster County and Dutchess County funds. Those are primarily for organizations to apply for funding, uh, but sometimes artists can partner with an organization to do a project or to uh, lead a workshop series, and then uh, benefit from those grant funds. So keep an eye on those as well. Those, that information is available on our website. So just looking at your introductions in the chat, it's great to see a lot of students here and uh, faculty. And it's, you know, this is something that, um, you know, you don't learn too much necessarily about grant writing when you're in school, especially when you're focused on your studio practice. But this very quickly will become a major part of your work when you graduate and you're trying to uh, secure funding to do to continue your work and um, get the materials and supplies you need and pay yourself for your time which is really important so first of all what is a grant so a grant is a, a financial award given to an individual a nonprofit organization or a private or public uh, from a public or private entity for a specific purpose and sometimes that purpose is very broad you know sometimes there's unrestricted funding um, but often a funder has a very specific idea in mind on how they would like the funds to be spent or even um, regulations they must follow on how the funds will be spent because it's taxpayer funds or public funding. So two types of basic funding, there's public funding and private funding. Public funding may come from all levels of government, federal, state, county, municipal, and it's usually taxpayer funding. Um, and it's aimed at meeting the needs of the community because it's coming from, you know, that funding is coming from the community. Private funding are coming from things like community foundations, uh, corporate grants, uh, and other privately owned entities. And they're mainly uh, interested in meeting their goals. Um, so often some of those entities are trying to meet community need, um, but they may not be. They may be more interested in uh, meeting their own interests or the, um, the personal goals of that funder. 
And so again, if anybody has questions while I'm talking or needs a clarification, feel free to throw it in the chat. So I'm gonna chat a bit about getting started with the process. And um, I'll start on the right side of the slide. And again, don't feel like you need to read all of this right now. I hope that you'll be able to use this as a resource when, you, when we get off of this workshop. But this is a list of some generally, uh, generally good places to start looking for grant opportunities. Of course, Arts Mid Hudson, some national organizations. Uh, Springboard for the Arts is a great organization to look for um, national funding opportunities and also just really wonderful resources. Uh, there's the Foundation Center, um, some other links here. Um, and when you're looking for these, I want you to start by organizing your ideas. So thinking about, you know, brainstorming right off the bat and figuring out what is it you're looking for right now. Because when you start looking for grants, you're going to see there are just a lot of different kinds of opportunities available, um, but often they are really, really specific. And so you want to make sure that you're really clear on what kind of funding you're looking for right off the bat so that you can focus your search in that area and not get lost in a sea of stuff that just isn't, isn't going to be eligible, you're not gonna be eligible for anyway. And so then you also wanna become familiar with the organizations that are posting listings like Arts Mid Hudson, like NIFA. Um, and when you find a new opportunity and there is a deadline, I highly recommend putting together a grant calendar. You know, if you use an online calendar like Google Calendar, um, you can just create a new one and have that be the grant one. Um, and just drop deadlines in and maybe two months before the deadline drop in a reminder that it's time to start looking at the grant. Um, especially if grants are reoccurring, you can, you know, set that to be reoccurring uh, or send a planner, you know, doing your written planner in some way. And that way you can keep track of what's coming up and not realize uh, a couple of days before the deadline that a grant you had heard about a while back is already coming up. Uh, research online, uh, look on other artists' CV. Uh, this is just some ideas on how to find grants. You might look at other artists that you admire or your work is similar to theirs. Look at their CVs and see if they've listed any grant awards they've received recently. Uh, look at databases at local libraries. Obviously do research online. Uh, I really recommend looking at um, you know, other artists to see if, they've, if you can find anything that other people have been getting uh, that are closely aligned with your work. And then once you see what's out there, you know, go back to that original planning you did and see what's actually available, what's possible, and if you need to adjust your original goals based on what you're even able to access. Any questions about this? Don't see any, but we can always jump back. Okay, so I'm going to introduce this, you know, this is what I'm going to talk about a lot, but um, introduce these ideas now that I want you to really think about right off the bat, try to put yourself into the shoes of the funder and identify what the funder is trying to achieve with the funding and what their goals and priorities are. And you want to do this because most grant programs, especially now with COVID going on, and um, I'll give an aside about my observations about how this field is changing a little bit due to COVID. Um, but there's limited funding available. They're usually very competitive, especially for unrestricted funding or funding for individual artists. And um, you want to make sure that your program is at least meeting their goals and at least falling within their eligibility criteria, because in a competitive program, they're just they're going to disregard applications that aren't meeting those basic things that they're setting out to do. So you wanna start by reading every bit of material that they make available to you and read it multiple times. I always tell people with our guidelines, read them twice. And I even point out a couple sections within the guidelines where I say, really read this section a few times to make sure you're not missing anything, especially lists of eligibility criteria or things that they say they definitely can't fund. You wanna make sure that you are very aware of that so that you don't spend a lot of your time working on a proposal that they cannot fund or aren't interested in funding. Identify what their goals are with the funding. What is the purpose of the funds? How are they trying to spend them? Are they really focused on paying artist fees? Are they more focused on equipment upgrades and materials? You might also look at um, what they have done previously, who they, like what the previously uh, successful grant applications have been and who has gotten funding. And you also want to see how those goals fit within that organization's mission and history and try to understand why those goals are in place. You know, why is this endowment even set up? 
you know, um, how, what has their history of funding been? That way you can get an idea of if you're, uh, you seem like a viable candidate for what they're trying to do. Identify the level of technical assistance they're offering. Um, for public programs, you're likely to have access to a lot of, a lot more assistance. Pri uh, private foundations might have less, um, and they often have, um, they might also be asking for a lot less in terms of your application, typically. Um, and so you want to take advantage of any technical assistance you can. And I'll even say, you know, for Arts Made Hudson, for our decentralization program, we offer extensive free technical assistance. We have grant, um, you know, the Zoom sessions, one-on-one -on -one appointments, draft review, budget review, brainstorming sessions, every, you know, if you can think of it, you know, we've even, I've had someone dictate an application to me and I've typed it in for them. Like that's the level of support that we provide because it's a public program. Um, for a private program, they may not need to do that level of support. So I often recommend to people, even though public programs can seem really daunting to apply to at first because they typically require more information of you because it's taxpayer money, they often also provide more assistance and it's a good way to learn how to write a grant or take, you know, I tell people all the time, take advantage of all of our free technical assistance and then whatever proposal you put together is yours. You can submit it to us, you can submit it to somebody else. Um, and so you take advantage of all that free assistance you can get. And just know that as our Arts Council, Artsmith Hudson is available to you if you're seeking some feedback. I often, um, you know, somebody is trying to figure out, you know, looking at a guidelines for an application for a funder, um, they might call us and say, can you help me try and make heads or tails of this, what they might be looking for, if this might be a good fit for me. Of course, we can't speak for them, but we can give our perspective. And then make a list of questions to ask the funder, even if you're not able to ask, because then at least you're identifying your problem areas. Um, but of course, if you just send them in, if they don't respond to you, you know, that's too bad, but don't be ashamed to ask questions. Um, there is no stupid question. Every question is valid. Um, and because, you know, I know for our program, even though I know it backwards and forwards, there is so much complicated information in our, in our grants programs because it's a public program. And so I don't judge anyone when they ask me a question. So just don't be afraid to ask funders questions and clarify information. If anything, it's helping you because if you're introducing yourself to them and you're familiar with them, um, they'll be able to, um, you'll, you'll be a familiar face when they see your proposal. And so some questions to ask yourself and try to establish. First of all, one of the most important thing is to determine who is making the funding decision. How are they determining and reviewing the grants? Um, so for example, at Arts Mid Hudson, it is entirely um, peer volunteer review. No one at Arts Mid Hudson votes on uh, funding recommendations. I just facilitate the conversation. And so for example, our individual artist commission is made up entirely of local Hudson Valley working artists. That is your audience. That's who you're writing to. So you want to keep that in mind as you're writing and know, okay, I'm not writing to the board of Arts Mid Hudson who might not be um, you know, artists themselves. I'm writing to actual artists who under, might understand my practice a little bit more. Um, I knew of a funder who, for example, when they uh, uh, review uh, the proposals, um, they actually, I'm skipping ahead to the third question, but I'll talk about now when you're asking yourself, how will proposals be reviewed? Um, thinking, you know, really understanding, it, are they going to view it in a specific order? Um, like if you were to call us and ask us, how is my application going to be reviewed? I would tell you, they will read it from top to bottom. They're not going to jump to an attachment first. They're gonna read everything in chronological order that it's presented. Other funders don't do that. They might have them read the budget first. They might have them look at the work samples first. So if you're able to get that information, that would be helpful to you so that you know, okay, this is the progression in which they're gonna read the information. And also that applies to work samples. I knew of a funder that they would present, uh, they would accept 12 work samples and they would have three slides, four images on each slide. And then they would do the first four, then the next four, then the next four. If you know that, then you know, okay, these are the four images I want to be viewed together. This is the progression I want the images to be viewed in. And it seems like little things, but it can make a really big difference in terms of your presentation, especially when it's a really competitive program. So if you can gain access to any of that information, ask for it and use it to your advantage. 
you know, think about what kind of funder they are, as we talked about before, public, private, or corporate, and what their interests might be in terms of funding this. Um, are they really interested in uh, just giving the artist uh, um, um, unrestricted funding so that they can do their work? Or are they a corporation who is really concerned with how many people are going to view their logo on a program? So you know, that's the kind of thing you want to think about in terms of, is this program going to be a right, the right fit for this funder? And then also looking at who's been funded previously. I talked about that before. Any questions about this? Not, no worries. So a tool as you're getting started, and I, I picked this up from a book I actually got at Barner Books, Books and New Paul's, The Artist's Guide to Grant Writing by Gigi Rosenberg. It's a really um, nice book. It's, it's very readable, it's very casual, um, and it's just an artist's personal thoughts on um, applying to many, many grants over the years. So I recommend that book. Um, and she talks about uh, free writing a lot. And I, I think this is just a great tool to get yourself going. And so picking a prompt or starting with a question from an application, set a timer and say, I'm going to write for five minutes or 10 minutes and just, you know, write as much as you can. Doesn't matter if it makes sense. Just jot down all your ideas in any format, bullet points or, or paragraph format, get it all out there and then use that raw material to jumpstart your formal responses. A lot of the time um, when I'm working with applicants to our programs, I, you know, they might send me a draft and I read it and I see, okay, I'm not really understanding exactly, I'm not getting the full picture here, but when I speak to them, I'm hearing the whole picture. And I feel like for people who might work a little bit better that way, sometimes it's better to just stream of conscious, get all the information out and then process it later. So I encourage you to try this tool at least once if you're having trouble getting started on a, on a difficult question for a grant application. So now I'm gonna jump into some grant writing tips um, and talk about the parts of a grant writing proposal. And I'll start off by saying that some funders are gonna ask for these things, some are not. Every funder is different. Um, they're going to call them different things than what I'm calling them now. Um, they might change it from year to year and trying to be more accessible or to be clearer. So just keep that in mind, but these are generally the components you wanna include. So there's your narrative, and this is really your written portions, um, your budget, and that is uh, something that you wanna pay really close attention to whatever format they're asking you to provide it in. They, a lot of funders provide a budget form that they create themselves, um, but others are going to ask you to generate your own form. If you um, need a budget form because you're applying to something and you don't know how to start creating a budget form, send me an email. I'm always happy to send out the Arts Mid Hudson budget form that we use for our grant programs so that artists can tweak it and work with it and use it for their own use. Actually, I'll send it. Uh, Zach, I'll give it to you so that you can send it out with, uh, with other stuff. Think about, uh, there, you're gonna be including work samples and additional materials. So that might be um, your proof of address or proof of residency. If you're a nonprofit applying, uh, even you know, if you're an artist working with a nonprofit, maybe you're being fiscally sponsored, um, you're gonna be required to usually uh, attach a lot more things such as nonprofit status, financial statements, board and staff list. Um, I like to recommend to people if you have a form that you're submitting, um, you know, it's like an entry form for the proposal, upload the attachments right away. If you have them ready, just put them in, upload them, especially if it allows you to save your draft, because then, you know, that's what always trips people up at the end. They're trying to submit and it's rejecting your file. It, does, it wants it to be a PDF or it wants it to be a different file size. So just make sure your stuff is accepted early on so that's not something that's stressing you out close to the deadline. So I'm going to talk about the budget now, uh, and that might seem a little backwards uh, in a grant writing workshop, but I think doing the budget first is really helpful. I think it provides a, an, an outline for your writing uh, because often that is the most important part of your grant proposal. It's how funds are going to be spent. And when you fill out your budget, you're establishing what your resources are, if you have any income coming into the project other than the funding that you're requesting. You're establishing what your expenses are and what your needs are. 
and then also determining uh, which of those expenses you're going to ask this grant to pay for. And so if you know all of those things, you know that you want to focus your writing on what you're asking the grant to pay for. Uh, so you never want a uh, review panel to get to the budget and be surprised and be reading about something for the first time. Because if they are, then they're going to say, well, how, you know, what does this have to do with everything I just read? I'll say this for work samples, but it really applies to uh, budgets as well. You want the attachments to support your words. You don't want to write a narrative and then get to the budget or to uh, the work samples and the panels or the reviewers say, you know, this isn't what I just read. This doesn't resemble what I just read. So a budget, typically I, I recommend using this helpful formula, expenses minus in income equals request amount. So that is the gap between your expenses and your income. That should be what you are asking of the grant. Unless it's an unrestricted grant or an award and you don't need to balance a budget, that's sometimes the case. But if the, um, if the funder is asking you to provide a balanced budget, this will be a helpful formula for you. As I said, work on the budget first and make sure that you're writing the narrative and the budget match. Again, you don't want them to get to the budget and be confused. Uh, and you don't want, you know, a typical error that we see uh, maybe within a, um, a written narrative. The applicant will say, I'm planning on uh, doing a performance that will be attended by 100 people. And then we get to the budget and for income, it says that they're going to sell 25 tickets. And there's no explanation as to why there is that discrepancy. So you want to make sure any numbers you're writing in your narrative match the numbers you're writing in your budget so that there, you don't waste, the panel doesn't have to waste time figuring out which is the correct number. If space is provided, prov uh, explain your expenses and or use a budget attachment. On our budget form, we provide an explanation area because you know, typically you'll have a line item that just says artist fees or technical fees. And if funding is going to multiple people, or if um, you know printing might mean I'm a photographer and I'm making archival inkjet prints, but I'm also printing out posters and flyers and signage, they might want to see a differentiation between those two things. So an explanation or a budget attachment goes a long way so that they, again, are not wasting time guessing. Uh, this is something I leave, I'll talk about later, but I'll just, I'm touching on it now, so I'll expand. Um, you want to control your panel uh, or reviewers discussion. And when I say that, I mean that you don't want to give them any reason to get off topic or get confused or try to figure out the answer while they're reading your proposal. Because typically they have a limited amount of time to discuss proposals. And then that's precious time away from them talking about the really good parts and they're focused on oh, well, how many people are actually coming to this event? I think I saw it here, or it says this in the budget and there, or you know, um, you don't say if a program is free or not or something like that, and then they're Googling it online and trying to figure out what it's been previously. These reviewers are gonna be people like us, right? So they're, 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 they're going to, they could get off topic, they could be trying to figure out some kind of information, and that's what you want to avoid. So uh, you wanna make sure that things match, and that you really checked off the who, what, when, where, why, and how of your project so that they're not trying to figure it out for you. Uh, pay attention to non-fundable expenses of the organization or funder. Ensure that nothing you are asking the funder to pay for is something they cannot pay for. Uh, so for example, at Arts Mid Hudson, we cannot fund food. Uh, we can't, you know, it's seen as a, a recreational uh, entertainment cost. So if somebody put their budget together and asked us for $300 for food or $100 for food, um, we would subtract that from their grant request and that would then be the maximum we can give them. So we don't want to do that. So we, that's why we try to catch these things ahead of time and you don't want that to happen to you. So just double check those things in the guidelines. And then of course, double check that your budget balances and that formula up at the top is a helpful way to do so. So now I'll talk about the main components of the narrative. And again, these terms can have a variety of forms um, in different uh, funders applications. So uh, the first component 
uh, is the summary or abstract or the project description. Uh, then there's the individual organizational background, a statement of need, and I'll expand on all of these in the next slides. Uh, a statement of need, your objectives, uh, a um, project, sorry, that came in twice, uh, and your, um, you know, that actually shouldn't be there twice. The summary and the abstract is usually a very short portion. It's usually just a very short description. The project description will often be more of a chronological, these are all of the activities and specifics about the project. So when I send out this PDF, I'll take out that um, little typo there. Um, and then a means for evaluation and determining how you'll um, see if the program was successful. And so all of these components are vital to a grant proposal, but a funder may not ask for them explicitly. Um, they may just ask for a, an RFP with just you know, two page max, give us your grant proposal. Um, and you then need to work all of these components in. Um, so that's why I like to provide them here so you can realize that if they don't ask for them specifically, even if they don't ask you what your objectives are, or what your goals are, it is important to include that. And if they don't ask you how you're gonna evaluate the success of the project, it's still important to include that. Um, so these are the main components and just consider that when you're looking at different funders applications. So let's talk about the abstract or summary. And again, I'll fix that project description typo. So um, it can be called any of these things and it's a brief overview of the proposal. It's their introduction to the proposal. It's often the first thing they'll read. And I recommend this is a good thing to draft out first, but I strongly recommend going back and writing the final version at the end. Sometimes when you write your whole project description right off the bat, or your, I'm sorry, your whole abstract or summary right off the bat, um, your, pro your project, your writing uh, evolves as you write the rest of the proposal. And so you wanna make sure your first bit is, is uh, and your introduction really encompasses everything else that they are about to read. So make sure you're double checking this at the end to make sure you haven't deviated from the original summary or abstract that you put together. You're gonna be asked to provide organization or individual background information. This are things like, you know, your name, your address, your phone number, um, you know, all of the information they're going to need to reach you. If it's a public funder, they might ask for demographic information or more specific information so that they can get a sense of who's accessing and applying to these programs. And you're also gonna be asked to provide a bio or an artist statement. Um, and so I recommend to applicants to our programs to keep your bio short and your artist statement, uh, your artist statement, and your bio brief, uh, because the focus is really going to be on what you will do and not what you have done. You of course need to show your credentials and show where you're coming from, um, and you know, they'll often ask for a CV and they'll get a sense of that there as well. Um, but typically, I recommend to leave any history or past information in those questions that specifically ask for it. Because if it's in the, um, if it's intertwined with your project description and what you're planning to do in the future, sometimes it can confuse reviewers and they're trying to determine what is actually, what is happening now, what has already happened. So stay focused on what you will do and leave the history in these specific questions. I also often recommend to artists, you might have, you have an existing bio, probably an existing artist statement. And these are kind of your, um, you know, like raw material that for each application you're going to tweak and add to it to make it relevant to whatever the funding opportunity is um, so have those you know but then plan that you're if you're applying to something that's really focused on materials or equipment that you might want to adjust your artist statement to reflect that or your bio uh, to show your technical skills um, whereas with another kind of project that's maybe more focused on um, public engagement you may want to focus more in your bio on your experience doing that and in the artist statement focus more on your community practice. So have like a, a version ready to go that's workable, um, but don't, uh, but be prepared to uh, expand on that and add to it. And so Joe just asked in the chat, what are the minimum important elements of a bio? I would definitely say, first of all, as I said, it does not need to be a super long bio. And I would also say that your CV does not need to be several pages long or go back many, many years. 
they're typically looking for your most relevant and recent work and they're looking for that to be reflected in the CV and the bio. So of course, where maybe where you're based out of, what are the key components of your practice, you know, themes that you typically explore um, and materials you typically use, that would probably fall into your artist statement. But for bios, you're gonna talk about um, your technical skills maybe, um, any community work that you do, um, any, uh, you know, educational or training that you've had um, or relevant job experience. And then also any like uh, really notable awards or um, acknowledgements or shows that you've had. So it's really like your greatest hits that you want to put into the bio and then plan to adjust based on what you're asking for for funding and who the funder is. Hope that answered your question, Joe. And if not, just feel free to ask for, for more. And okay, cool. And so uh, you're also going to want to show the relevance of and awareness of your the relevance of your work and to and awareness of your field. Um, so if, for example, um, you want to figure out if there are other artists working, you know, maybe this funder has funded an artist that's working in a really similar format or a similar medium to you previously. That could mean that they are inclined to. Uh, fund that kind that type of artist again it could mean that they're not looking to fund that type of artist again um, so that's something when you're looking at the their materials to be aware of but in your application you want to show that you are aware of contemporary trends in your field that your work has relevancy as in in communicate you know in conversation with other work happening now or if it's not and it's really unique you know talk about that talk about why it's not in line with contemporary trends in your field or why you're trying to challenge that. And then I threw in here for organizations because tip, a lot of the time artists are applying with a fiscal sponsor organization. They're going to need to provide this information as well for them. And so uh, for organizations, you're, you're going to want to see relevant institutional history um, that communicates the scope of their work and how that relates to your work, that there's a synergy there and that it makes sense that this partnership is occurring. They're going to want to know information about the leadership, uh, hopefully the uh, diversity of the leadership and diversity of decision making and power within that organization and for people who are working on a project collaboratively. And they want to see an establishment of credibility that you have a track record, um, that maybe you have received funding before and you've had successful projects before. Um, and if you haven't and you're, you're pretty new to this, um, highlight that you're a new applicant because uh, especially if an organization or a funder is, is seeking out people who are first time grant, uh, grant applicants, that's often uh, something that's a priority for funding. And so just another general tip that you're writing for somebody who knows nothing about you and nothing about your work. You never want to make assumptions when you're writing a grant proposal. You know, hopefully you'll have good luck and there'll be someone on the panel who has seen your work before in person or is familiar with you or took a workshop with you or something, but you can't count on that. And typically reviewers are reading on their own ahead of time and then coming to a group discussion later. And you don't want them to get all the good information at the end in that group discussion. You want them to come there ready to advocate that your proposal needs to be funded because it's so amazing. Um, and so uh, you want to make sure that you're not assuming anything, you're not leaving out critical information. And so that's why it's important to have outside people look at your proposal and give you feedback. If you can find a trusted friend or colleague or me at Artsman Hudson uh, to review your proposal and give you some feedback, um, there's some things that are really obvious to you. You know, you know, I know how to video, I know video editing, even though I'm a painter. Um, and, but if they get to your, you know, say you're trying to move to a new medium and um, if you don't have the relevant experience on your CV and you don't tell them, they're not going to know. Um, so you don't want to make assumptions and you don't want to assume that they know anything about your proposal. And I'll say uh, about you or your previous work. And I'll say one more thing that um, going back to understanding who the reviewers are, um, for example, our individual artist commission is made up of uh, typically nine working artists in the region but they are from all different mediums. So, so there might be a visual artist, a theater artist, a uh, sculptor, um, a photographer on the panel. And so you don't wanna, if that's gonna be the case, if it's going to be a variety of backgrounds reviewing your work, 
then you don't want to make assumptions about them knowing the materials or the medium or the techniques and you want to make sure that those are very clear and it's not going to make you look like you don't understand it because by explaining it and laying those things out just going to show that you're giving a courtesy to the reviewers and making sure that they're very clear on what you're doing alternatively if you're applying to uh, you know, if you're a theater uh, or if you're a photographer and you're applying to a photography focused grant, then you don't need to include that kind of information because you could probably assume that the reviewers are going to be well versed in the topic. Okay. Okay. Statement of need. So this is one that a lot of grantors will ask for it specifically, but often it's kind of rolled in with other components in the grant application. So this is where you're going to make the case for it's kind of the why now you know why do you need this funding now um, what is the problem that you're trying to solve with this funding what are you trying to achieve uh, and what is the need for the this program or this project or this initiative and um, you want to show that with objective data so if you for example uh, are an artist that does a community practice and maybe you've done a, you know, done some crowdsource, you're doing some information gathering, you're sending out some surveys, you're talking to some community groups and trying to understand community need, um, or you're trying to, uh, you've identified that um, as an individual artist, uh, you really need to um, purchase this equipment if you're going to move to the next step in your career. So just establishing what is the need right now for this and what can you, what data can you provide to back it up um, that this is something that's really critical to your practice or to your next steps as an artist. Um, this is more for or, you know, individuals working with organizations, but as I said before, showing the connection between um, the need and the mission of the organization. So seeing that what you're laying out, you know, what you're trying to do with the project is in line with um, what the mission of that organization is if you're seeking a fiscal sponsorship and you're trying to find programming uh, funding for a public program or a program of some kind. Some questions to consider for individual artists. How will this help your personal career growth, especially for applications that are specifically trying to, uh, you know, especially for unrestricted funding uh, uh, opportunities or for specific, um, you know, project uh, opportunities you want to make a case for how this is going to advance your career and allow you to leverage this funding to do to maybe seek out additional grants or additional opportunities. Funders really love getting testimonials from grantees who say, you know, I got your $1,000 grant, I did this project, and then I was able to leverage that grant um, through the success of it, and I applied and I got a $6,000 grant from this other foundation. That's the kind of thing they love to hear. And so that's a good thing to, you know, if you have any plans like that, drop it into your proposal because it shows that you're already starting to think about next steps beyond the grant and how you will extend the life and the impact of the investment that they're making in you. What will the project do for your audience? So thinking about, especially if it's something, a, a funder that is community minded, um, what is the impact on the community going to be? For Artsmith Hudson, our Individual Artist Commission, we see the Individual Artist Commission as a way to communicate to the public the important role that an artist plays in a community. And so um, that is critical to our, to our application and to, our, to, you know, to the program as a whole. And so we want to know within the application if there's going to be, you know, how the public will see you out working or see your work presented at the end. Um, and so that's something that, uh, or alternatively, if it's, if it's not community minded, but maybe a funder is going to be interested in how much you're able to grow your audience. So maybe you're going to be creating work over a period and uh, you're going to, um, you know, be doing work in progress shots and really targeting specific groups to try to expand your social media following or your email list, like saying those, making those goals for yourself and stating those here um, are really helpful in terms of um, why you need this funding and your statement of need um, and why this will advance you in the future. You wanna talk about what is new or different and why is now the time for the project. Um, so especially if you have a long established career, um, you know, talking about why this represents an important next step 
or what this will, what doors this will open for you by applying to this funding or receiving it. And then just one note here to be mindful of your tone. You never want to project a sense of entitlement or demanding funding. Um, and, you know, sometimes that doesn't, you know, especially with um, current, uh, our current circumstances, um, I think that uh, panelists would and reviewers would likely be more forgiving because we are in, for lack of a word, better word, dire times in terms of, um, you know, COVID and everything that's going on in our country. And so we want to, um, you want to make sure that uh, in your proposal, you know, we're all living in that environment. So it's not, you know, you want to make sure that you're not projecting that it's just happening to you or something. And it can be a little difficult to catch that on your own. So again, it's, it's helpful to have other people review and ask them, you know, how's my tone throughout the proposal? The project description is going to be your overall scope of the project. Um, it's often provided in chronological order. This is again the who, what, when, where, and how in detail. You might note any potential anticipated benefits and goals of the project, and you'll often include a timeline. And funders are not typically looking for, unless they ask for it, they're typically not looking for a day by day, week by week timeline. They're looking for the most important dates. They're looking for general activities by month, maybe. Um, some funders will ask you to provide a separate timeline. Some will just ask you to intertwine that with your project description, or they'll give you no direction at all, and it's kind of up to you to figure out how to work all this information in. Um, so focus on the most important dates and also check their funding period. You know, if their funding period is only for a year, and you have something on your timeline that's outside of their period and their funding period, make sure it's clear that you're not asking them to pay for that part, but it's important to the project and you want to include it or whatever it might be. And then again, ask somebody to review the information and check that uh, your proposal and make sure that all, all of that information is there. And then this uh, other component, means for evaluation. Again, some are going to ask for this specifically, some are not. Um, and you'll first get to answering this question by asking yourself, what is success for you? What are you trying to achieve? Will it be successful to, will it be a success if you're able to create 10 new paintings? Or will it be a success if you're able to um, utilize, you know, a, a several new professional development opportunities and training opportunities? Um, will it be a success if 200 people show up to the event? Um, or you expand your following, just figuring out what is the goal you're trying to meet? What, is the, what will success be for you? And then determine how are you gonna track the success of that program? And the reason this is important um, and something to consider when you're looking at all these grants is figuring out what you're going to be required to report to them if you are to receive funding. Some organizations or funders are going to um, just do an interview with, with you at the end or just um, get some information at the end. Some are going to ask for attendance by zip code, a final budget with all the information on how funds were spent, narrative questions, um, or a combination of all those things. So you want to be showing in your proposal that you're prepared to give them reports and that you are setting up plans on how you're going to be able to uh, track your success. So, for example, if success for you is that you're going to get um, 700 views on a video that you're producing, then telling them how you will track all those things, that you have access to your analytics on your website, uh, you have access to the YouTube analytics, um, and you are going to be, uh, you know, getting feedback on this survey form, whatever it's going to be. If it's appropriate for the project and that's part of it, let them know how you're going to track all that. It could be as simple as one sentence. You know, if it's something like, uh, it will be, you know, you're determining it's going to be a success if 200 people show up. And then you just say, we're going to have somebody at the door with a clicker counting how many people show up. So that's how you're going to track if you're meeting that goal. So it doesn't have to be a big, scary undertaking to figure out these things, but you want to make sure you're planning ahead and not, you know, right before whatever the event is, trying to figure out how you're going to do these things. They're going to, for reporting, they're going to be looking maybe for objective data and subjective data. So that means like numbers, like how many people showed up or how funds were spent. But then they're also looking for, you know, a description from you on what the impact was, you know, what this meant for your career, uh, how audience members responded. 
Um, so again, think about how you're going to gather those things. And I know this sounds like, oh, I'm adding a whole other, you know, more homework after you do your grant proposal and you get the funding, you're going to have to do these reports. It's important to the funder, but all of these things are really important to you as well. You know, knowing who your audience is, where they're coming from, you know, maybe you're tracking zip codes of who attends your event or who visits your website, their locations. And then you can see, oh, wow, I have a really big following in uh, Beacon, but nobody from Poughkeepsie is looking at my stuff. Maybe I should start promoting myself more there. Um, so these tools are often for the funder, but they really are, you know, very valuable to you as well. And then um, just impact of COVID-19. I'm hearing a lot from other funders that um, they are taking a bit of a relaxed approach to the objective data because some of it is really difficult to gather now. And um, there's you know, been a, a big push for compassionate grant making and leniency, um, which I'm really in favor of. I don't know how long this mindset is going to last because we've spent really the past many years so focused on data, 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 numbers, you know, prove that this um, money that we give out has impact so that we can go back to the state and ask for an increase next year. Um, that's still going to be important because, of course, we have some, you know, uh, funding is going to be limited now due to what's going on with COVID-19. Um, but just keep in mind that um, funders are often very willing to work with you once they funded you. So it's important to put these plans in place for your proposal, but there's often going to be some leniency after the fact because um, you know, they have invested in you, they've committed to funding you, and they're gonna wanna see out that you are successful in your project. And now just some general tips, and then I'll talk briefly about work samples, and then we'll have time for questions. Um, so some stuff I've touched on so far, but I'll just refresh. Uh, use clear and concise language. Again, often competitive programs, submissions, of missions, and you want to be sure that they are getting right to, you're getting right to the point and giving them a really clear picture of uh, what you plan to do with the funds and what the plans for the project are so that they're not sifting through a wordy proposal and trying to uh, figure out what you're trying to do. Describe how funds will be spent. Use enough specifics to understand the project and to demonstrate your planning in place. Controlling the panel discussion, I talked about that before. That means uh, don't, letting, don't let the reviewers get off topic by uh, providing distractions like uh, in, uh, inconsistent information or missing information uh, or half information. So you wanna give a very complete picture so that they, are, they have everything in front of them and all they can do is uh, love your proposal. And you want to show evidence of your artistic merit, your um, track record, the feasibility of the project, showing that it's likely to happen, and you demonstrate this by showing your planning and you know what you're planning to do. Um, demonstrating your need and potential impact. Um, so that's uh, talking about you know how many people you hope will see it, or if you'll hope that you'll expand your reach, um, and to use uh, out any outside support. So if you have additional funding coming in, or if you have uh, a volunteer that's working with you or if you have access to a space, you know, note that in here because it improves the feasibility of the project. And then going back to earlier, we're talking about what the funder is looking for, um, and we're talking about review. Uh, really, if you can figure out what the review criteria is, that's invaluable because then you're kind of figuring out what, what your scoring rubric is. I can tell you for Arts Mid Hudson, I base this uh, really off of our Arts Mid Hudson criteria, which is artistic merit, impact and feasibility. That's, those are the three areas. You, each reviewer rates on a scale of one to four, and so it's a maximum uh, score of 12, and then we average them all out at the end and we look at them that way. And so when you know that, then you know you're looking for straight fours in those categories and you wanna show evidence of those things throughout. Um, so that's how Art Smith Hudson does it, but every funder is different. More short tips, write in future tense, don't write in past tense. Again, it's a proposal for what you will do, not what you have done. Avoid words like hope or try, say what you will do, and don't ask for permission. You know, they're putting out this grant opportunity for you. You do not need to ask for permission here. You are, you are trying to access the funds that they're making available to you. And avoid the passive voice. Again, you wanna speak in future tense, you wanna use deliberate words, and you don't want to sound wishy-washy or unsure about what your plans are. 
marketing promotion, I'll talk, I'll speak about this very briefly because I think I spoke about it before, but a helpful thing when you're, an, especially for an individual artist, when you're trying to uh, answer a question about marketing or outreach or promotion, I recommend first establishing who is your intended audience, who are you actually trying to reach, um, and that could be broad. It could be the entire Hudson Valley or, you know, every, you know, people in Dutchess, Orange, and Ulster counties, or it could be, I'm just trying to reach people in Midtown Kingston, or I'm just trying to reach people in New Paltz. Once you've identified the audience, then start thinking, how do they get their information? What are the ways that I can reach them? And then you can really string together a nice uh, compact uh, response or um, narrative component that describes who you're trying to reach and then how you, what components and what tools you will use to reach them. And especially if you're trying to reach out to an entirely new audience or group that you've never interacted with before, you wanna talk about any community groups or any individual contacts that you have uh, that you will work with in order to reach out to those people. And then Emily, you asked uh, how many reviewers are there for Arts Mid Hudson Grant and who are they typically? So for the Individual Artist Commission, it's typically either seven or nine reviewers and they are all working artists in the Hudson Valley in Dutchess, Orange or Ulster counties. For our community arts grants, it is a variety of um, community members who are, you know, go out to arts events. Uh, it is, uh, you know, people who have experience in marketing or community engagement or promotion, uh, uh, you know, at arts administrators, artists. So that's a more of a, a broader, um, and we'd like to get some outside voices, people who are typically just audience members as well. Um, we have a panelist nomination form on our website. So I strongly recommend you can nominate yourself. Uh, or if you know somebody who would make a good panelist, please uh, submit them to us so that we can reach out to them and, and involve them in the process. And now I'm just gonna give a couple of final notes about work samples and then we can take questions. So um, again, I touched on work samples a bit earlier, but work samples are the only visual representation uh, that the reviewers who may be curators, they may be panelists, jurors, uh, they may be other artists or board members. It's the only thing they're going to have to go off of to experience your work. Because again, you're going to assume they know nothing about you and that they've never seen your work before. So the work samples are critical and they should not be an afterthought. They should, I would, I would think about them early on. And if the um, funding organization is willing to review work samples and give you feedback, take advantage of that for sure. Um, and also there are a lot of or local organizations um, who do, um, portfolio reviews, those are always great things to take advantage of as well. I know for photographers, CPW in Woodstock was doing that for quite a while. So as I said before, your work samples need to support your words. So you don't want them to get to see your work samples after reading your proposal and say, okay, this is, this is not what I thought it was gonna look like at all. That, sometimes that can be a good thing, maybe a, an element of surprise isn't such a bad thing, but you don't want them to get there and say, you know, after what I just read and now what I'm seeing, I don't know that they can complete this project or I don't know why they're trying to do this project. Um, so they should really go hand in hand. And you want to read all the instructions on work samples and their guidelines thoroughly. So adhere to all their file sizes, uh, file size requirements, image size, formatting specifications. Um, at Arksmith Hudson, I give a workshop annually about this. So um, if anybody would like, send me an email and I'll make sure you get notification when we do that. Um, just about resizing images and, and making sure you're maintaining a good resolution, even if you are changing the file size to meet their specifications. Typically, if you open your computer, the image full screen on your computer and it does not appeal, pix appear pixelated, it will be enough, uh, good enough. Uh, and just so you know, typically they're asking for these smaller file sizes because if they're too big, they're not going to load for the reviewer. And that's the last thing you want. You know, you'd rather it be a slightly smaller image than them not be able to see it at all. So follow all of their specifications and make sure, again, you're trying to get those in, you know, at least testing out the system to make sure it will accept them early on so that you're not the last minute, you know, the file is too big and you don't know how to resize it. Never send excessively large files um, because you know they will rarely load on the other end. And, and typically, you know, especially if they are looking at a lot of different stuff, they, they don't want to receive a ton of those things and, and it might irk them a little bit, to be honest. 
Um, so try to get your file sizes uh, smaller. And again, uh, look out for us for a workshop on that if you, if you struggle with that. And you want to create a clear and accurate depiction of how your work will look in person. So really look that the colors and the textures are being communicated well. I strongly recommend, you know, not everyone has the financial means, but if you are able to invest in a few really good images of your work by a professional photographer, those can go, that investment might go a long way on the other end in terms of getting you grant funding. So um, if you're planning to start applying to a bunch of grants or larger, more prestigious grant opportunities, consider that because um, they will be able to make your work really shine and make sure that it is really accurate to life. And uh, actually in that workshop I give, I do give some like very specific, some very simple kind of like hacks on how to do it yourself. Um, and you can look up things like if you're a sculptor, how to make a very inexpensive light box uh, so that you can photograph your work or to get you know, a white sheet in order to take a photo. Um, but, you know, sometimes, you know, the investment of the equipment to do something like that, it's not worth it. And you would rather, it might just be better just to pay someone else to, to take those photos for you if you have the means. And um, anytime, if you're on our list, um, there have been some um, really great free programs where people have offered those resources for free or at a discounted rate. I know actually some uh, SUNY New Paltz, we used to do that at SUNY New Paltz with the photography department used to do that as a fundraiser. So if you see anything come up like that, definitely take advantage of it. And so I'll run through these last tips about selecting work samples. Um, you might, I like to say this a lot, you're not necessarily selecting your best work, your favorite work, or even the greatest range of your work. You're selecting the most compelling example of your work and the work that is most relevant to what your proposal is. So this will be um, work that may be either related thematically or material, you know, the materials are similar. Uh, you want to make sure that there's a connection, especially because you're often writing a proposal for work you haven't created yet. And artists will struggle and say, you know, how, what work do I select to represent work I haven't created yet? Uh, so select what is related thematically or in terms of materials select recent work, you know, funders usually want to see, you know, work within the past five years. Some funders may want to see only your work from the past year. Um, so make sure that you're clear on what their requirements are. If you're, uh, uh, I think I spoke about that right then. And then um, ask what the review process is, ask how they're going to group your work, as I talked about before. Check for technical glitches, you know, never export a PDF and just upload it. Always open the PDF, take a look at it and make sure everything that you wanted them to see is uh, clearly there. And if they'll allow you to, I strongly recommend including a descriptive list of all of your attachments with stuff like the uh, title, the date, the size, medium, and um, organizing them by the file name. That's really helpful. And, and of course, I didn't put this in the, and I'll add this actually to the PDF. It's really important that you label your files really clearly um, some system grant accepting systems will keep all of them together really well, others will not. So you want to make sure that everything is labeled clearly and that they can understand, especially if you're providing a descriptive list, which one you're talking about when you provide that information. And so I've just thrown so much information at all of you, and I'm glad that Zach was recording it so that you could go back and learn more or listen again if you would like. Um, we also have on artsmidhudson.com right now, uh, org right now, we have all of those videos I spoke about earlier about the decentralization program on our YouTube page. And those include a lot of the tips that I spoke about today and more specific information about those programs. But I'm happy to take any of your questions now um, and see if there's anything else that uh, we can talk about before we wrap up. So Zach, I don't, uh, I'm gonna just, maybe we should stop, I should stop sh uh, sharing my screen so we can see everybody. Sounds good. Yeah, so just jump in. <laughs> Joe, what's question About um, some applications will have a section that says optional, like to say you can also, what do you feel about that? What are your thoughts about the sending that for additional stuff? So in my experience, whenever I've set a question to optional, it has been because it's something that really applies to some applicants, but for others, it doesn't apply at all. And then when they fill it out, it just kind of seems off. So if you don't have something really critical to write there, I would probably not include it. 
Um, and you may be able to work that information within another question. Um, I would have to know what the specific question is to really give you an accurate idea. Mm -hmm. um, but for example, uh, you know, we had a question on our application before that asked specifically if the uh, work, if the artists were in this, this question is different now in our application. We used to have a question that asked if the project was engaging under, or was uh, employing or working with underrepresented artists. And I made that question optional because to be frank, if they weren't, the responses were quite strange. You know, they were kind of like, <laughs> no, you know, and that didn't, that was, you know, if, you, if you're not, you have no business writing anything there at all, right? And that, and honestly, we hope that you are engaging some underrepresented artists in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, if you don't have something relevant to put there, it's probably best to just leave it blank and see if it's a, a little nugget of information you can stick in somewhere else. Does that answer your question? Yep, it does. Great. Anyone else? I have another. Okay. <laughs> well, if you were in a gallery show that um, that the gallery itself got funding for the show for your show, like so, you know they applied for a grant for Joe's show, is it? Um, are you pushing it by including that information when you're listing the show? You know to you're trying to show off or something like say I was in X show that was supported by a puffin grant or something like that is that good information to kind of squeeze in I or, think so yeah you definitely want to show that other if other funders have funded you in the past even because, if it was a gallery that they funded that they funded the gallery for your show that's, that's oh, oh I see I see um yeah I, I don't see why not I mean like you know you, uh, you I you know you got that uh, the LGBTQ center in, mm -hmm. in Kingston got a grant and uh, you, you were funded, you had a show there through that grant. Right. Uh, and I would hope that you would actually use that going forward okay. because, you know, they, you know, they got a grant, they selected you and it was, you know, you were a part of that process. They applied with you, you know, so especially you such, such show funded by XYZ. Yes. Oh, okay. especially, especially if they applied for the grant with you, you know, yes, then you were part good. of the reason they got the funding. So you should definitely include that. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Lilia, there's a question in the chat from Amy. Do you see that? I see it now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So the question is, are there any individual artist grants specifically for the Mid-Hudson region that you know of besides Arts Mid-Hudson? Um, at this time, I, I'm not aware of any currently open grant opportunities, but I would recommend looking at the Community Foundation because sometimes they have some grants that you know, they're, they're not often specifically for artists, but sometimes they pop up and an artist might be aligned with a, a grant opportunity. Um, but keep an, again, artsmidhudson.org, artists opportunities and job opportunity and job listings. If we get anything that into us, that is where we will post it. Um, so that's a good place to look and, and keep your eye on because, you know, again, that gets updated um, daily, if not weekly, you know. Thank you. Um, yeah, I want to just ask you really quick. Um, sometimes I come up against um, grants that are for parents, like artists who are parents. Mm -hmm. I never know the right tone to use in the statement. And I was wondering if you had any advice for that. Hmm. That's an interesting question. So, I mean, if it's, again, if it's really focused on that purpose, I think, you know, ultimately, you want to be yourself within the application. I think that's the safest way to go about it is to not try to be someone else or take on a specific tone. And when I was talking about being mindful of your tone earlier, that's more you just want to make sure you're not sounding super demanding or entitled or angry or upset or something like that. Um, but I think that, you know, I, I want to talk to you about this more maybe in the future and kind of hear what your, could you talk a little bit more about what You've yeah, like, um, I'm not sure whether to approach it in a very analytical way, like here are my needs and here is what I am asking for mon monetarily, mm -hmm. or if it should be a little bit more like heartstring pulley, mm -hmm. or, you know, um, is it is it a, a risk to be too whiny, you know, that kind of thing. Right, so you want to project um, feasibility, the ability to complete the project, and so uh, I don't know that you necessarily need to think, unless, again, you want to think about who the funder is. It could be mm -hmm. so different depending on, you know, if it's an arts organization that really understands, you know, working parents and their struggles with uh, art making, um, and they're going to give you studio space and give you a grant amount, um, and they're aware and they work with people like this on a daily basis, 
uh, then you might just be a little more to the point. These are my needs. These are the, you know, the obvious struggles that I'm experiencing, um, you know, trying to balance my career and, uh, and, you know, make, and, you know, make time for all of these things and access this uh, funding opportunity. But if it, you're writing for a foundation or a corporation or a board, maybe you might think about being a little bit more uh, narrative driven, uh, mm -hmm. maybe uh, painting a little bit more of a picture or a, uh, a statement of need, right, about, and, and not, I wouldn't use the word heartstrings necessarily, right. <laughs> just a little, you know, going a little bit more in that direction. Again, okay. it's you want to establish who the audience is and then go from there. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. So I saw some other came up. Uh, Justin asked, can you speak on government funded grants for public works? Justin, when you say, oh, so such as new, for new buildings, public parks, et cetera. So uh, one thing to keep in mind, like for Art Smith Hudson, we can't fund permanent public murals or permanent sculpture. And there are some funders that are gonna be unable entirely to fund permanent public work, especially if it's with taxpayer funding, because then it is, uh, the reason we can't fund it is we can't fund per, a capital improvement to building our land. We can't fund something that's going to ultimately change or increase the value of that property. And that was really you know, in place because uh, this, this funding is meant to be for artists who advance their careers and not for building owners to try to raise the rent on a building or something like that, right? So um, you know, just keep that in mind. First establish that they will fund something like that. Um, and then if it is for um, the, if it's going to be a permanent public piece, um, then you're going to really want to think about community um, and what the community, uh, how you're responding to the community that already lives there and how you are, you know, reflecting and getting feedback from them. And I think that could make for a really compelling proposal because, you know, for example, we did a really great project, Arts Mid Hudson, a few years ago with Arts uh, with O Positive, uh, and it was called the Poughkeepsie Gateway Beautification Project under the underpass in Poughkeepsie when you're coming up uh, from the train station. And we got a lot of applications from all over the country. And, you know, ultimately that committee said, we really want a local artist because they're going to know the community. They're going to, uh, they're respected within the community. People will see this person's work and know it's theirs and know they're their neighbor and um, be happy that it's here. Um, they are aware of, um, you know, making sure that the work is sensitive to community history. Um, so if there any opportunities like that pop up locally, take advantage of them. But if you are applying to something that's in another place, do your research and figure out who is the community that lives there, what's the local history, and make sure you're not submitting something that's way off base from what is relevant or uh, you know, applicable to that opportunity. And so ultimately we went, uh, the panels, uh, the review panel for that selected uh, Boogie Rez, um, who is a local Poughkeepsie artist. Uh, she did a wonderful job. That's, I encourage everyone to check out that mural. I hope that answers your question. Okay, cool. Great. Other questions? I got another one. Yeah. If, as far as how it will advance you, do you think it's a legitimate budget submission to, um, to hire a photographer to document a project? Yeah, I, I definitely do. I, I think that at least getting, you know, a few really good quality images can go mm -hmm. a long way. It will present yourself as, you know, really being established and professional. Um, but also just, you know, especially if your work is very detail oriented, it's not going to get captured if it's in a low quality image. Um, How about so in the, in, uh, putting in the budget for a grant to include that as one of the line budgets photographer to come in and is it? it depends on the grant. So if they will fund something like that, like, oh, okay. for example, the Individual Artist Commission Arts Mid Hudson is focused on the creation of work. Oh, no. okay. so that wouldn't be an appropriate ask for that one because um, that would be more of a final finishing cost or a presentation mm -hmm. or a next step cost. But if you were getting unrestricted funding for career advancement, that would be a great thing to ask for. Thank you. Yeah. And I know, I know it's on Facebook Live. I don't know if anybody over there has anything or. I haven't seen anything yet, but I'm going to double check again. I've been trying to look on my phone. No worries. I think if there's any final tips I want to throw in or final shout outs to 
you know, again, please check out the decentralization grant program. And just a reminder for current students, it's full-time students are not eligible, but actually part-time students are. So if you're a part-time student, you are eligible. Um, just if you're concerned about that, just let me know and I can, I can check your eligibility for you. So there's nothing on the comment section. Um, I will say if anybody is here that uh, wasn't registered uh, and you would like to receive the PowerPoint, if you can either just chat your email address into the chat or send me an email, I'm going to send you mine here in this chat now. Um, and I am just gonna drop uh, my email, uh, my emails in the chat as well so that you have access to them, but they will also be in the um, PDF. Lilia, can I ask a question? Yes. This, hi. Um, so who happy when uh, potential applicants contact you directly? Like sometimes when I'm applying for like other kinds of grants, I'm like, oh, is it weird if I contact the foundation? Are they going to, is that going to compromise my application somehow? Or is it good to establish a dialogue and a relationship if I've got questions that I want help with? Yeah, so uh, I can't speak for everyone, obviously. I, I really like it when people call me and I, I, I really prefer it when I'm able to establish communication with an applicant before they apply. Because then, you know, I see myself as, my, as the advocate for the applicant during the process. And if you can identify somebody like that at the funding organization and meet with them and you know, okay, they're gonna be there during the panel meeting. If I tell them the idea of my project and the panel gets it, gets a little twisted when they're reading and they don't understand exactly what's going on, that person might be there to clarify a little bit and explain, oh no, I spoke to them and although it's, it, it can read that way, I'm, I'm quite sure that they are intending to do this, right? And so setting up that line of communication is helpful. Um, but one thing I'll caution is you definitely don't want to call like a ton of times, right? You don't want to, if they're not getting back to you, you don't want to be, you know, very forceful uh, unless you know you're running out of time, you're really worried they're not going to get back to you in time or something like that. Um, and you want to uh, just uh, first read all the materials that they've presented to you. Because if you're asking some really obvious basic, you know, if you're calling and saying, hey, I'm just calling to find out what the deadline is, they're going to kind of be like, well, that's in bold at the top of every page on our website, yeah. right? So just look up those that information first, um, and then you can, um, you know, if they're really specific questions, you're trying to get a sense of how they're going to review, they're going to say, okay, this person's really thinking strategically about this, and they'll probably be a little impressed, I think. Okay, thank you. Unless, of course, they say, do not contact us. If no, they say, no, do not contact them, do not contact them. <laughs> <laughs> they take that seriously. <laughs> Good to see you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you so much for today. Yeah, of course. All right. All right. Well, so if anybody has questions uh, later, um, you can uh, you can you know email myself or Lilia, and uh, we will send out the uh, PowerPoint uh, once I'll give you time to make those edits you wanted to make, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we'll send that out uh, within the week uh, um, uh, to those who have registered and. Um, Thank you, uh, everybody, for joining. Best of luck on your future grant applications. I know it is, uh, we're all sort of looking for every bit of help that we can right now. And uh, uh, other than thanking Lilia, I also do want to thank Arts Mid Hudson for everything that they do uh, for this area, for artists and arts organizations, and and really the people, uh, the, the audience that that you serve. It's uh, it's it's an incredibly valuable resource, and the organization, uh, and all of your wonderful wonderful staff uh, are so. Uh, we're just so lucky to have them here in, in the Hudson Valley and and in the Mid Hudson uh, specifically. So uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks to everybody here. Yes, thanks everyone. Thank you, Zach and Anna and the Dorsky and Sue New Paul's. This is a lot of fun. I'm glad we got to do this. All right, everybody. Have a great uh, rest of your week and uh, we'll follow up with you all shortly. Thanks again. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye.